because you never know, I might just begin. So, okay, I'm still reading people's welcomes, even though I'm starting the talk now. Uh, so this is, I don't know how many sort of classes we've done all together, but um, quite a lot. And we're probably about halfway through this little book uh, in the chapter on good friendship. It's the second or third possibly uh, session, I think the second on, on good friendship, which is a beautiful topic and very rich. So I'm definitely encouraging lots of uh, input today. I may have some questions for you as well around role models and who they are for you and why, um, because this is something we often lack in today's world, I think, really good role models, that people that we can look up to and learn from, and that we feel are perhaps even more virtuous than ourselves, at least in some ways. There'll be weaknesses and strengths in all of us, but you know, to have someone you can look up to in some regards, and there might be many people, is just so important as we will see. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to get straight into it. It's page 88 for those who have the book. So welcoming those who came a little bit later as well. I see you all, Olivia, Sean, yeah. Maybe there's a second screen as well. Wow, we're on double screens. I was making sure I have a sense of who's here. Wonderful. So lovely to be together. <laughs> Good, so this uh, little paragraph starts, it's called Good Friendship in the Household Life. And I don't know, perhaps the household life can be applied also to monastic life. Maybe sometimes they don't apply so easily, but I'm sure we can take the, uh, the spirit of this. So, and this is from the Anger to 8, number 54. So you can always go back in there into the text themselves and reread these and see how they relate to maybe... Uh, other sutras, or whether this is just an excerpt, sometimes there can be more. Uh, but here it begins. What is good friendship? That's the question, isn't it? Here, in whatever village or town a clan's person lives, they associate with householders or their children, and I am changing the language, uh, whether I should or not, into a gender neutral or a gender inclusive language here whether young or mature virtue, sorry, whether young and of mature virtue or old and of mature virtue, who are accomplished in faith, virtuous behavior, generosity and wisdom. One converses with them and engages in discussions with them. Insofar as they're accomplished in faith, one emulates them with respect to their faith. Insofar as they're accomplished in virtuous behavior, one emulates them with respect to their virtuous behavior. Insofar as they're accomplished in generosity, one emulates them with respect to their generosity. Insofar as they're accomplished in wisdom, one emulates them with respect to their wisdom. This is called good friendship. So there's already quite a lot in here that I find very interesting, and I'm sure more of you will have insights as well into this. But uh, first of all, I find it interesting that we're talking about, um, you know, the kind of people that we should converse with. And I don't know if the, the opposite holds true, that we shouldn't converse overly much, at least with people who are not accomplished in faith, virtue, generosity and wisdom. But certainly here we're being encouraged to converse and have discussions with those that we feel are. And of course, in the Buddha's teachings, it's not only that it's important to hear the Dhamma, but it's also too important to discuss it as well. And I know that's why many of you come to this uh, discussion class, because it's nice to actually have the opportunity to clarify points of the Dhamma and to build upon them or to uh, question them or even disagree, right? Because that helps us get clearer about what's true for us. And so the conversing and engaging in discussion is something very uh, much encouraged by the Buddha throughout the Tipitaka, uh, throughout his teachings, basically, in the Pali Canon, and something that used to happen a lot in ancient India, and I think still today. And then not only that, but insofar as they are accomplished in those things, one should emulate them in that respect. So I find this very beautiful because 
presumably a person doesn't have to be perfect in every respect in order to be emulated. We can maybe ignore or disregard aspects of them which are not so inspiring, but still look for something that is. You know, so perhaps they're not so strong in in maybe wisdom, but they have strong faith and we can emulate them in that respect. So I think here it's also bringing in that faculty of discernment, you know, that we're able to distinguish which qualities we see in others that we want to develop within ourselves and which qualities in others that we maybe don't need to kind of develop or don't need to kind of maybe make such a big deal about, right? Unless it's really very harmful to us, we can still perhaps find something to emulate in in some people, in most people, I would say. And this is very important because, you know, like it or not, we will be emulating the people we're around. <laughs> whether or not they're virtuous, whether or not they are wise. It's just unfortunately or fortunately, perhaps, um, an attribute of being a conditioned phenomena rather than a, a kind of permanent entity that is this way or that. You know, we do pick up the behaviours of other people around us, and so it's important to be careful who they are. Um, you know, so, I mean, obviously, if we're very established in virtue and wisdom and have a lot of discernment, we might be a little less influenceable than others. But even for myself, I certainly notice that, uh, you know, when I'm around people who are less established in the Dhamma and speak less about the Dhamma and inquire less, perhaps, into the meaning of life and, you know, virtue and all the rest, then, yeah, a little bit of inspiration might fade or I might start to feel a bit kind of less uh joyful less inspired mainly um and after a while kind of disengage a bit from that kind of small talk that doesn't seem to go anywhere so we will be picking up you know the, the attributes of people around us naturally and that's a very beautiful thing when the good qualities rub off on us but here it's actually saying we emulate them and i think that's a little bit more active as well like we actually can feel confident enough to emulate that, those people. And uh, certainly from being around my own teachers, it's, it's strange because I don't necessarily intend to kind of become like them, although it would be wonderful in my mind to become as compassionate and wise and patient as some of my teachers. But I do find I start emulating even the bad jokes sometimes, not often, hopefully. Maybe I should emulate more of them because some of them are not that bad. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's just bizarre how we can start to sort of think and act and speak like our teachers and sometimes people even say I'm starting to sound and even look a bit like my teachers <laughs> hopefully uh, well I don't know if that's really true but it's interesting how we start to resonate you know really interesting and uh, I don't know but for me there's very obviously some people in my life who bring out my best you know and, and at least help me get a glimpse of what that could be and others who maybe it's more of a struggle to be around and make me actually feel quite bad about myself or, you know, point out my faults every second moment, even when I didn't intend something the way it landed, you know, and then you feel like a little bit defensive or, you know, misunderstood. So I think that's very natural. So insofar as, as those people are accomplished in faith, virtue, generosity and wisdom, we emulate them in that respect. And this is called good friendship, right? So this is, again, pointing to why it's good friendship, because we will be influenced. We will be conditioned. We need something to look up to, something to guide us. And, um, and I'm kind of curious to know what people think about this. Um, you know, the kind of people that we do look up to, who are our role models and why. So... Before I do open that up, I just want to say one more thing, which is um, one of the things I really appreciate about uh, Ajahn Brown is that he often says that we should stand on the shoulders of our teachers. So whilst we would emulate them in respect to their strengths, he would also say, don't stop there, you know, actually take it further. 
And I was saying this to my parents tonight. I was saying, you know, certainly there's a lot to uh, look up to in one's parents and they have more life experience, etc. You know, when we're young, there are first teachers, like it or not. Some are, you know, better at what they do. Some have had their own troubles and struggles. And maybe we have difficult upbringings, even abusive upbringings. Um, and yet still there are first teachers in many ways. Sometimes we also learn from people how not to be, isn't it? And it's still lessons we can learn um, but I think to be really effective as a parent or as a teacher even a school teacher let alone a spiritual teacher we have to want to um, to give others the education the inspiration the knowledge to take it further than they could you know and I think that's part of respect like for me, if I really respect my teacher, then I don't just want to be a clone, right? I mean, it'd be good enough. I'd be, I'd be happy with that, believe me. <laughs> you know, if if you really kind of have that faith in the depth of somebody's wisdom and compassion, then you'd be very happy. I'm not talking about mannerisms or any of, you know, the superficial things, but just in respect to that. Yet still, we can take it further. We can find our own ways to articulate the Dhamma. We can find our own strengths, um, that may be different from theirs. And I think that's important too. So standing on the shoulders of the wise is also a last little point I'd like to uh, say. So, um, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm just reading the messages and there's a little comment in the box. So I'll read that since none of you have your hands up, but then I am going to dig around for some input from you all. So get thinking about role models and what they mean to you. Okay, so this comment is uh, interesting that the maturity of one's virtue is not dependent on one's age. Yes, yes. <laughs> this is very good because we had this discussion just now with my mum and dad. <laughs> Can you please talk about what is meant by mature virtue? Right. Yeah, maturity of one's virtue is not dependent on one's age. And at first my mum said, yeah, but maybe it is to some extent because, you know, people who are older generally have perhaps more virtue actually I don't know that virtue is the point maybe more wisdom at least more life experience yet really not always and if you start to look at things like past lives if you have the sense that there is such a thing you know even before I was a Buddhist people would talk about old souls <laughs> people would look in my eyes and say you're an old soul I say oh you're an old soul too of course there's no soul but uh, <laughs> there's a sense of like having been there done that sometimes right in people even who are fairly young and of course virtue is something like an aspect of one's character so to me it's less a symbol of someone's age um, or associated with someone's age and much more associated with actually how people are brought up maybe something of what they bring from past lives too but very much according to how we're brought up I mean I still have a lot of gratitude for my parents that I was brought up to be basically kind and empathic and caring, you know, and to think about others even more than myself. Maybe that's not always uh, in line with the Buddha's advice, but certainly I appreciate that very much. So, yeah, what is meant by mature virtue? I think um, it's about practice again, you know, it's about being established in virtue to the point where it becomes quite unshakable. So in this particular context, mature virtue, I mean, it could be a whole spectrum you know, of uh, virtue from maybe keeping the five precepts diligently and, you know, for life or very rarely making mistakes, all the way to kind of that virtue becoming a part of one's character and it being impossible to break any of the precepts, you know. But it could also be to do with, because I think that virtue has to mature also through action, active virtue, not only restraint, so I, I don't know if this is from the suttas or the commentaries, but my first teacher, Goenkaji, used to say there's two kinds of virtue. There's vādita, sīla, and charita. Vārita and charita, sīla, virtue. Uh, vārita is abstinence. Charita is doing something. Charity still means to do or to go in, in Hindi language and probably in Pali as well. Um, so I think it's really because you can keep increasing your virtue, your goodness, your kindness almost indefinitely. And the more you get, the more you have to give, you know, like the more virtuous you become, the more energy you have, the more you want to give and share. So I think there's really no limit to that. So in here, it's not really sure 
what exactly it means, but certainly I would say someone who you can look up to in that regard. You know, for myself, one of the um, most important uh, attributes that would qualify someone to be a teacher for me is that their virtue should be more mature than mine. You know, if if they're a really good teacher, even if they're they might be a lay teacher, if their virtue is wonderful, fantastic. But you know, if they're still kind of I don't know messing around with the opposite gender, like I, I mean, I just whatever that person may say, it may sound wise, but it has to manifest in a, a transformation in that person's life. And if it doesn't, then it kind of uh, it isn't someone I can look up to in that regard. But then there may be other ways I can look up to those people. So it's important, I think, to have respect. That's a bit of a long-winded answer, but does that touch on a few things there? Is that okay? Yeah. So anyone else want to do the Q&A? You want to? You ask you to unmute. Thank you, Gunther. I was trying to work out where he was. Thank you. Oh, great. to. Um, yeah, that's a very, the word teacher brings up all sorts in me to start with. Okay. So, um, um, so that could be that, well, we've got school, of course, there's a, there's, there's a school experience. I didn't have, I had one maybe good teacher and that was because, and if I think of the people I've learned from, it's because I felt more that they weren't superior, like over me. They were more alongside, more along. Um, I didn't know that at the time, but this is in reflection. If I think about that, I find it really difficult to, even with like someone like Ajahn Brahma, it's like, it's almost like, and when I met well, both of you in person, my experience of you in person was so different from the, um, video thing or people asking questions there was more conversation so when you talk about talking about the dharma i really felt more safer and more uh, it was more relatable and it was more relational actually i sometimes find the q a's um helpful but the teacher thing i get quite anxious about that so that's just even the word teacher never mind what i the, the i guess the qualities would be that if I'm looking for some uh, sort of help, I need them to explain why they are saying this to me rather than that's that, go and do it. Don't like the rule thing. It's like if they're telling me why and I get an understanding, then, I, mm. then it's more in integrated, I suppose, and don't yeah. feel so controlled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. Any of that sense did in my mind. So... I don't know if that was more of a comment than a question. <laughs> Probably yeah, not. No. It's very interesting. I think I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people can relate to that. Uh, and maybe, you know, due to one's experience as well, like you say, you know, in reflection, the teachers that you respected and felt most, uh, you learn most from were more like walking along your side. I think that's a lovely way to put it. And I've also noticed that the teachers I'm drawn to, they never sort of pitch themselves as higher. And it's actually those qualities that, for me, render them teachers. It's like the humility um, mm. and the relatability. I mean, when I first met Ajahn, I was so awestruck that I could barely speak. And he soon knocked that out of me by just joking around with me, like really silly stuff, you know, like, behave yourself, you're a male nun. <laughs> He'd say things like that. And I'd be like, and you're a female monk. <laughs> I thought, oh, that's cheeky, isn't it? But then he, he really enjoyed it and he like encouraged me. And after a while, I realized why he was doing it. And it was so that I'd ask questions and kind of think for myself. You know, obviously, I thought for myself, I'm pretty rebellious. But um, <laughs> I don't know. I kind of, for me, I like the combination of reverence and also feeling like I can speak to a teacher as a friend. And that the two seem to develop each other a bit as well for me. But yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. I think it's really helpful. Is there anything else on that anyone would like to add? Because I think it's... um. Probably what the Buddha advised, actually. Tamale. Tamale? Can you hear me? Perfectly. Yeah, um, I just, I mean, probably a very simplest way of explaining is just on the point of age. Um, I do find, um, like, my little ones really, you know, sometimes 
there's so much wisdom in simple things and I do feel like they teach me a lot sometimes so sometimes the way maybe we've been conditioned to think and then we say oh no um what do they know but when you actually listen there's so much um that makes sense Uh, I'll just go to the box here. Isn't it important to discern who to emulate? Exactly. I think all the people who were abused by Roman I think of all the people abused by Roman Catholic priests. They came across as holy, but then there was their behavior. Exactly that. And that's why I think here the Buddha's talking about in respect to their virtue, right? Virtue is uh, action. It's virtue is behavior as far as I'm concerned it's not what you say or what you think what you believe it's how you live and I think it's so important for us to really scrutinize anyone that we might consider someone we want to learn from I mean when I use the word teacher I am using it in quite a Buddhist sense and maybe that's more pertinent to me as a monastic that you know I've always felt it important to have a teacher because I'm actually learning something like there's a very obvious course of practice and training that I'm undergoing um so yeah I mean absolutely and I think that's the whole point about the Buddha saying this you know that we have to uh first of all associate with people who are of mature virtue etc cetera, etc cetera. virtuous behavior generosity and wisdom and faith and and you converse and engage in discussions with them so probably with these Roman Catholic priests I mean did you engage in discussions with them so it's important, isn't it? Because it can, people can get away with more when they're sort of not open to scrutiny. And um, I think it's so important to the monastic to be willing to answer people's questions, you know, and, and to say if you don't know and to admit if you might have got it wrong. Yeah. Um, shall we come to Diana? Yeah. Diana, can you move, please? Yes, hi. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about who I emulate, what kind of people, who they might be. And I think they come into, I'm writing down the kind of the categories of the people. Like one would, it was very interesting what you said, Venerable Chanda, about Bodhita and Charita, the two kinds of virtue, because it did stand out to me in the passage that before he talked about faith, virtuous behavior, generosity, and wisdom. He said to associate with householders or their children, whether young and of mature virtue or old and of mature virtue. So the bottom line is mature virtue. And from that builds on the faith, the actual virtuous behavior, generosity, and wisdom. And I think it's true for me too, like people who I mean, sometimes I really kind of look up to certain celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's silly, you know, like people that are famous because I see them in, you know, the media or whatever. And it's people that are doing a lot of humanitarian works that I look up to a lot. People who are really family oriented and monogamous and respectful to their partner like sometimes when they get divorced I'm like well I don't like them as much anymore you know because that, that was part of the thing that I looked up to like that ability to be committed and um honest and people who are in recovery from addiction I look up to people who are abstinent so that would be like restraint um and then People who are established in Dhamma are spiritually, what I think, advanced, you know, like I I want to emulate all those kind of people, just in general, without naming names. <laughs> okay. So um, I think the foundation of all of that is the mature virtue, which is the two arms, the Sheila and then also the Dana, the action. Thanks. 
Hi. Yeah, I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, I actually thought exactly the same thing that Tamali said about children. So I've got a son and I've noticed how much I learned from him. And I think her point around children having not being so conditioned so as we get older we you should do this you should do that you should think in this way and often my son he's only four but he comes out of things i've noticed this for years that you come and say oh actually you're right now as a parent your natural reaction is no you listen to me but he's actually teaching you things or says things you don't realize you do um, and I think that relates to this thing, doesn't it, about age and also having an open mind because it's easy to fall into you should do as you're told. And I notice as well, <clears throat> you know, sometimes I tell him off, don't do that and don't do this. And then he starts shouting back at me. Whereas if I sit down, talk to him, why did you do that? He tells say, well, I just wanted to play with you, for example. And he said, well, just ask. And so it's this, it teaches you on so many levels on how to behave things you're doing that you shouldn't be doing. And then just relating to this thing about idols and things like that. Um, you know, historically for me, it's probably been a lot of business people, um, but uh, the virtuous behavior, et cetera, is not always shown in those people. Um, and certainly, you know, for, from a, a, a you know, Buddhist perspective, it would be the likes of yourself and and um, and Ajahn Brahm and Abraham and and other people. Where and I think one thing for me, for example, when I met both of you and everything I've seen is is that relatability. We say I didn't feel awestruck, so I felt it was very easy to approach you. It feels very joyous. It feels natural it doesn't feel like it's a, a a path that you must do this and that and it makes you happy I guess that that's so for me and and as we say sort of from other people in general picking out the nice behaviors or the ones we think are virtuous is is what works for me anyway so nice thank you for that I love that sort of humility of you know both you and Tamali mentioned listening uh even when we think oh you know we sh we know best and I guess it's even more important when a person's young right like even a child and uh just that humility to be able to say well maybe they're saying something that I should look at or what they're saying is right and uh yeah I really also like how you um, mentioned happiness you know because that's an important one isn't it like who you feel good to be around and why because sometimes we feel like quite on edge to be around certain people makes you feel tense and that's often a really good sign that maybe there's something you need to look at there <laughs> maybe there's something in that person that doesn't mean quite true or you know maybe they're out to get something from you or not to be fully honest so yeah that happiness and ease around a person is so important yeah so it's a uh, going with the heart a little bit there huh yeah yeah thank you wow uh, very rich it's really lovely to hear this. I'll just go to the box. There's a couple of comments here. There's a wonderful poem from Tibetan Buddhism, which helps. And this helps me remember that there's metta in myself too. Great. Do share that if uh, you, you get your hands on it. Maybe not now to distract you from the, the discussion. But if, uh, if you know a link or you want to share it another time. Sounds lovely. Yeah, there's metta in yourself too. Absolutely. And in a way, that's why we... I think we naturally start emulating people, actually. I'm not sure it's something we have to actually make ourselves do. For me, like people that I regard as teachers, I guess, are people who point me to what's inside more than anything. You know, they kind of help me to see the goodness that's there in a way. I think you can use time or age to mature, but it doesn't say how mature your one is. Oh, uh, yeah, good point. Yeah, like that it's a personal maturing, but you can't necessarily compare yourself to others, right? I have a classmate that's half my age, but he's at least as mature as I am regarding all dimensions. Wow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're all in different classes in a way. <laughs> it's a classmate, but, you know, Ajahn Brahm makes this nice simile of uh, you don't judge the juniors, right? People in the junior class, class, I don't know, grade one. 
as like inferior to those in grade six. It's just they're, in a, they're not yet in grade six. So it doesn't make sense to compare two people with each other. You know, we've all got our strengths and weaknesses, but as long as we can see in ourselves that we're maturing gradually through life, not always in every aspect, right? I find there's some weaknesses in me that are more stubborn than others. Uh, and sometimes it seems to be really on the up and then you hit a hard patch. And, you know, if you are always measuring yourself and trying to judge where you are, it could be very disheartening, but often the challenges we face are harder. So how can you say we're actually not progressing? It's just the challenges are harder. So it's more... It brings up more difficulty sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. So important to respect young people. I actually really, I wish I had more teenagers in my life because I, um, as a teenager myself, I felt like, I, I don't know, maybe I wished I could have been listened to a bit more. And I think it's such a kind of critical period in one's life. Uh, so much going on. I really have a lot of empathy for teenagers. I'm always quite curious as to their experience. Can be quite a transformative time. Oh, I just see Nayali coming in. Hey, she's nine, but she's already teaching her mom a lot, and all of us, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, one more comment in the box. For me, at the moment, it's more that I don't want to emulate. I find. Oh, sorry. For me, it's more what I don't want to emulate. Yeah. I find I'm distancing myself from people who have morals and ethics, which I don't want. Yeah, good. Good. Absolutely. It's both, isn't it? It's like we have to protect ourselves from that. And in a way, that's more damaging, right? Because you probably already have a lot of goodness in you. Sometimes it's enough just to, you know, protect yourself from the harm. Um, there is that poem. It's in the front of this chapter. Uh, I think it's from the Sutta Nipata, but it's about if you don't find one equal or better, then wonder alone. So I think that relates to that. This is a side note, but it looks like you have a halo over you, <laughs> especially when you move a bit. Okay, <laughs> move to the right a bit. You mean the mirror? Do you mean the mirror? That's moving to the right a lot. <laughs> I assure you, I don't have a halo. <laughs> but that's that's kind of sweet. <laughs> Okay, one more. I was interested in the question that Ling asked. Oh, did I see it? Could you talk a little about creating good conditions to find good spiritual teachers or friends? Sorry, I might have missed that question. So thank you for bringing it back to my attention. Thank you very much. Um, does it relate to someone's comma to meet a good teacher or something I can do to create good conditions to find a good spiritual teacher or friend? Um, I don't know about karma because karma is something we create constantly. So it's not a fatal a fate thing. It's not that you're kind of either fated to have uh, good teachers or good friends or you're not. I think there's a lot we can do in terms of uh, preparing ourselves for that, as in learning to discern, right? Sharpening up our discernment about what qualities we really appreciate in a person and then once you actually know what they are you might start seeing them everywhere in places you don't even expect um creating the good conditions is always a really wise way to practice because we can't control the outcome uh so i do think creating good conditions means like having the intention uh like i say changing your perception maybe of the people who you already have around you but also practicing and generating those qualities within yourself. Because if you have a lot of kindness, a lot of uh, patience, for example, you tend to meet others who do as well. So I do think that's uh, one of the things you can do to create good conditions. Did you want to say something as well, Ling? I might have answered some. Give me a mood, please. Thank you. I'm Jennifer. Um, the reason I ask that question, I kind of remember I heard um, sort of um, saying, maybe it's from the Zen tradition, I can't remember, it says something like, um, um, your teacher only appears when you are ready. I can't remember exactly the phrase. So that was um, why I sort of karma, you know, like, I remember, like, I met Ajahn Brahm's book about almost 10 years ago. And at that time I was so inspired, but I can't even get a chance to, I even emailed, is there any chance that he come to France? And, but 
often in, in a couple of years, um, maybe through the practice, maybe, and I, eventually I met you, I, you know, like I was last year, first time I could join online and Zoom with him. So I was just wondering, um, of course, I, I love those virtues and I, I, what you just said exactly touched my heart. If I want those and I need to cultivate in myself first. Um, but that just that phrase, it was like, oh, maybe it's my past karma and oh, <laughs> something. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm really glad that you're coming closer and closer to, you know, to people like Ajahn Brahm and, and to the Dhamma and to the practice and, you know, wanting to cultivate all that in yourself. So certainly your karma is extraordinarily amazing. Otherwise, you wouldn't be, you know, in these kind of Dhamma discussion groups, right? I mean, who else is choosing to do this this evening? okay it looks like a big group but it's 30 people <laughs> you know across the whole of Europe and stretching to America and <laughs> you know it's not many people so um it's rare to come in contact with the Dhamma and to develop faith in that Dhamma so that's extremely extraordinarily good karma already um something else did come to my mind and I'm trying to remember what that was um something to create the good conditions yeah, uh, I think the Zen phrase that you were talking about is something like when the teachers, no, when the student's ready, the teacher will come, something like that. Yeah, I mean, it is a very Zen thing, and I don't know how much absolute truth there is in it, but I would also say like karma is an action. And to me, one of the things that's uh, been a strength, I think, is that I persist. Whether I'm really ready for such teachers, I don't know, but I kind of enforce myself on them. <laughs> I mean, I am sincere, right? I'm sincerely practicing. There's nothing else I want to do, but uh, I don't give up. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons that I create these. Uh, I, it's, it's, I don't know what it is. It's good fortune a bit as well. And it's conditions coming together, certainly. And it won't last either. So I shouldn't get complacent about that. You know, teachers pass away. So I think as long as we um, understand the purpose of a good spiritual friend that really it's to learn to imbibe those qualities because we can't depend on them forever you know uh, but certainly when you see something good try to have as much contact as you can that's what I try and do yeah and I've noticed the more people kind of uh, persist the more contact becomes possible it's even the, the case with um people in this community it's like not necessarily because they ask but it's like the people who consistently serve a lot they tend to get closer contact even if it's only you know a five minute chat with Ajahn Brahm at the end of a talk to sign a book but it's different because I will first of all introduce them as well and there's some kind of connection there you know through being close to the Dhamma through serving a lot as well yeah can we come to Olivia you have your hand raised for a while please yeah um i was i i think i was thinking about what's really helpful for me is looking for what's beautiful in the people around me and focusing more on that and i'm a lot happier when i do that yeah beautiful. yeah that's very wise practice because that way you're not just looking for perfection or some kind of like outward symbol of someone who's supposed to be holy right and you're actually training your mind and once you start doing that you'll see it everywhere just like if we look for the faults we see it everywhere isn't it you know yes. you just look for the things that trigger you all the time you're just gonna get really wound up <laughs> So, yeah, that's brilliant practice. And it's what's meant by sense restraint, at least part of that. You know, sense restraint just doesn't mean turning away from things. It actually means using your senses in a way that's going to promote beneficial states of mind. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Anything else you wanted to add? Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll just check in the box if I've uh, got everybody's comment there. All right, please feel free to ask again or contribute more at any point. And uh, just to say as well, it's nice to see Melanie there. And uh, I'm not sure who you're with. Is that your sister? It's Marion, right? No, it's Crystal. I can't tell. Marion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you look like Crystal, but you're not Crystal. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. And also, who else is there? I saw Cass is there. I've not seen you for a long time. Lovely to see you too. Oh. Okay. So, shall we keep going with um, another part of a sutta? Yeah. All right. So, this is good friendship in monastic life. And this is the classic sutta that many people have heard, but maybe only heard in part from the Samyutta Nikaya, 45th chapter, verse 2. And this is uh, to Ananda. So the Buddha's talking to his close uh, attendant disciple, who's also his cousin. The Venerable Ananda approached the Blessed One, paid, paid homage to him, and sat down to one side and said, Bante, which means venerable. This is half of the spiritual life. That is good friendship, good companionship, good comradeship. So here Ananda thinks he's had a very deep insight because it's a whole half of the holy life. So he's feeling that's a lot. It's really important. But the Buddha says, not so, Ananda, not so, Ananda. This is the entire spiritual life, Ananda. That is good friendship, good companionship, good comradeship. I'm just pausing because that's kind of a big deal. And then this is the reason. When a monk or a nun or anyone else has a good friend, a good companion, a good comrade, it is to be expected that that person will develop and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path. So to me, that's very beautiful because this links up the purpose of a spiritual friend or having a spiritual friend with the practice. So unless you actually develop the Eightfold Path, is it really much use having a spiritual friend? <laughs> You know, maybe you're just wasting the opportunity, right? And maybe that's going to create bad karma if you have a, if a spiritual friend and someone in your life who could inspire you, but you actually miss the opportunity. So it is to be expected that they will develop and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path. So again, pointing at conditioning, isn't it? It's almost inevitable that you will start to practice properly. And how Ananda... Does a monastic or a lay person, <laughs> I'm adding that in, uh, with a good friend, develop and cultivate the noble eightfold path. Here, one develops right view, which is based upon seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, maturing in release. So this is a bit different, and this is quite deep, because we're not just talking about right view that stays as view for example or stays at the so-called mundane level but right view when it's really going to get you far has to be based upon seclusion that means a lot of practice right uh, not only physical seclusion but also seclusion from the hindrances seclusion from the senses you know in deep meditation that means paviveka uh, nisitam. Nisitam, which is here translated as based upon, literally means like sitting on. So standing on, sitting on, seclusion, right? So with seclusion as its foundation. And that doesn't mean you're always in seclusion. Otherwise, you won't have that wise friend. <laughs> but you go off and practice in seclusion, which is based upon dispassion. And the word for that is viraga which Ajahn Brahm also translates as disappearing or vanishing, fading. Here I think dispassion is fairly good because it does mean, well, it's both. I mean, what you're not passionate about tends to fade, right? It tends to fade from your awareness. So it's like a lessening of the clinging and also cessation, that's niroda. So when you don't cling, when things start to fade, eventually they disappear from your radar. Even you can see that with thinking, right? So first of all, you have, say, you, you, first of all, you become secluded from the thinking, you know, you don't focus on that. Then you kind of lose interest, you know, and the, and the thinking starts to fade and eventually it stops when you ignore it long enough. Maturing in release. So the outcome of seclusion, of fading away or dispassion and of cessation matures in release. So you're released in this example from those thoughts, for example. And then one develops right intention or right motivation, as Ajahn Brahm likes to translate it, based upon seclusion, dispassion and cessation, maturing in release. One develops right speech 
based upon seclusion, dispassion and cessation, maturing and release. <clears throat> and then he goes through the other aspects of the Eightfold Path, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right stillness, let's call it, or right samadhi, which is also all of these are based upon seclusion, dispassion and cessation, maturing and release. So this is really deep practice of the Eightfold Noble Path. And uh, just a word here about the word right, because I know that can kind of also trigger things in people uh, who are kind of conditioned to feel that, you know, some kind of, especially people who've been lectured at about good and evil, right and wrong, bad and good. Um, the word right can sound a little bit moralistic sometimes, but what we really mean by right in this context is right in the sense that it's leading to release it's leading to freedom it's leading to enlightenment in that sense it's right according to the goal so it's the right practice to develop to take you to enlightenment this is what it means so some people have suggested using the word wise but wise is not essential a wise way to practice sounds to me optional <laughs> You know, you can, it's wise too, but there might be other things you can do or there might be, you know, other things you need. But right is like right and also sufficient. It's enough in and of itself, all of these things together. So it's in this way, Ananda, that a monk or nun or layperson with a good friend develops and cultivates the Noble Eightfold Path. So I think emulation is also involved here as well, because presumably our friends, our wise friends also ought to be developing these things based upon those things too. And I like to remember that for myself because I do do quite a lot of solitary retreat. And uh, sometimes I feel like, oh, am I abandoning my community? You know, is it kind of taking too much time away from the project? But then I remember, no, it's being an example in seclusion. And that's actually a phrase from the suttas that one should be a leader in solitude. So that can be a lesson in and of itself. You know, it's one thing talking about retreats. Retreats are good. Meditation's good for you, blah, blah. But if your teacher or the, your friend would never do those retreats themselves, then you'd be like, hmm, really? Then why don't you do it? <laughs> then why are you so restless? Why do you always, you know, get busy and don't take that time for yourself? So... And then the Buddha continues by follow by the following method. Ah, so this is a second method now. So not only are we going to start developing the Noble Eightfold Path with a good friend, but this is something else. So by the following method too, Ananda, it may be understood how the entire spiritual life is good friendship, good companionship, and good comradeship. By relying upon me, and this means the Buddha himself, as a good friend, Beings subject to birth are freed from birth. Beings subject to old age are freed from old age. Beings subject to death are freed from death. Beings subject to sorrow, lamentation, pain, dejection and despair are free from sorrow, lamentation, pain, dejection and despair. By this method too, Ananda, it may be understood how the entire spiritual life is good friendship, good companionship, and good comradeship. Ooh, that gives me like the chills a little bit because they are my goals. <laughs> and it's just so wonderful that the Buddha can show the way out of all these things. And again, I think emphasizing that it's not about believing him, it's not about him being right. His interest is in beings being freed from suffering, that's it, you know? So, I mean, as Olivia said, and I think very beautifully, like the practice is to free us from suffering, right? The, the practice is to use our minds in ways that elevates them and brings us happiness. It doesn't even matter if that person has a lot of faults or, you know, if we believe this or that about the teachings, what matters is that our hearts are becoming lighter and more joyful and more free. So this is the direction that the whole teaching is going in. And you could also use the word right to mean right in that sense, right in that it's freeing us from suffering, you know, that there really is an escape. And it's right to seek that escape. Yeah. So I love this sort of, but I would like to um, stop getting over inspired and talking too much. 
<laughs> and invite some uh, some discussion. Does Nikki? Yeah. Please, Nikki. Okay, that confuses me somehow. I don't know why. Um, I'd like to ask you a question. As you're talking about this, and I'm wondering, um, I remember, I think it's when I first met you, actually, when you said, when I think I was probably complaining that there was no Buddhists around for miles, and I'm on my own, and I've got no one. There's probably fair play. There, there wasn't. And um, I remember you saying, well, to stay away from the wrong company, I say that like that, and that is, is something. So even though I was on my own quite a lot in solitude it, and I was seeking, of course, that wise friendship, actually, and, that, 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 and it wasn't there, but, um, and I was there was some pain around being on my own around that and there was that you said that that really helped now the next the bit i want to ask you is so i've reached over the year or so i've met somebody that was a buddhist and we've been sharing bits and that and then sprouted this uh, and they're certainly quite spiritual but they they will go off on i got to make sure they're not in the room i got paranoid <laughs> they just look no, they're not. All right. I don't know why all of a sudden I thought, oh, um, I want to, I don't want, you know, I would, I would, I'm saying it with kindness and love this, but they go off and they do go off and smoke weed every so often. And um, and I don't, I don't take drugs, you know, I keep, I'm very, very, you know, I have to, you know, with that. And, um, and it's left me, now particularly today, I'm even thinking about, they come back, as if nothing's happened for them because nothing has happened but it hurts me and it really puts me in a place of confusion and I think I can't be around this but there's a great loss attached to that as well right, right. so it's well, you said that very beautifully though okay you've so articulated it very beautifully like you've articulated your feelings about it and I just wonder if I know that's really hard and I have no idea if that would feel appropriate but if you would articulate it that way to them because it to me it comes across as though you really value them and actually care for them a lot and yeah. there would be a loss and that that seems quite touching like it doesn't seem judgmental it's just you're talking about it as confusing for you and it just seems very vulnerable and open I wonder if that might I did say that I didn't they were like they didn't understand and I think that's as little they have so little self-worth that really hurt as well it hurts that they're doing that to themselves so I wonder, because then a part of me goes, I don't want to be around that because it makes me uncomfortable. There's a, because um, there's a fallout from that, quite a big fallout from that. That just go oh, anyway. So it makes it very difficult, and it becomes about that, mm -hmm. which I don't know if I want that anymore. To something to become about that. Right. Yeah. 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 I guess it's something you have to know for yourself, right? Like. Is there a way you can have that contact, the, the part that is nourishing, maybe yeah. from a distance somehow, maybe, you know, not in person too much or in a place where they can't do that, maybe in a public place, I don't know. So um, you they don't see them. <laughs> I can't tell you. I'm not asking you to tell me what to do, yeah. by the way. No, no, that is an option. Absolutely. It absolutely is. I mean, if it's not nourishing you and if it's causing conflict and confusion and, you know, you feel like that's just not where you're at. That's okay too. I mean, we shouldn't feel guilty about that, you know. Um, you can still send the meta. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Buddha does say, right, that we we can be discerning in who we hang around with. I mean, monastics don't hang around with that. That's why you become monastics. You go to monasteries to be around people who practice virtue. Uh, it doesn't mean you condemn other people, but we choose not to be around it for our own protection as well so especially if you're feeling confused or like vulnerable in some way then maybe that's not what you need yeah yeah it has to be a personal I mean it's not something anyone else can and has the right to sort of say but um yeah it's entirely your choice <laughs> can I come to Veronica Veronica can you unmute please yep I just wanted to refer to the previous speaker's conversation 
Nikki. And I just recall you saying about Adam Brown talking about a tiger. You don't, you can send meta to the tiger. You don't have to go and touch the tiger or cuddle the tiger or whatever it is. That just sprang to mind to be appropriate for Nikki. I don't know. people support one another like this. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to Bill. Uh, can, Bill, can you unmute, please? Got it. Yeah, I, I can really relate with what Nikki's talking about as somebody who abstains from all intoxicants except cigars, which I am smoking today, my apologies. Can't, can't Sorry, Bill, could you come a bit closer to your computer? Because your sound is quite um, hard to it's, catch. It's, it's the earbud. Is that better? That's loads better. Okay, now I can't hear you, but you can hear me. But I, I can relate with uh, Nikki as somebody who will not, I do not take any intoxicants, but I do smoke cigars. Sorry. Um, we have to protect ourselves. And that's why I'm on this path in order to develop a sense of self to, in order to bring myself to the next level, whatever that is. And level is not, it's not as, I'm not finding this a linear path, but um, yeah, if somebody's making me that uncomfortable, I, I, I have to, like the tiger, perfect example, wish you well, but I, I cannot engage Thank you so much. Can we come to Sean? Yeah. Uh, hi, yeah, it was kind of leading on. <clears throat> it's not the same as what Nikki was saying, but hopefully it might be helpful and maybe for other people that, yeah, I've had some difficult times recently with people very close to me within my family. I also work with them. Um, and, you know, with a family, obviously there's a, there's a sort of relationship built in there and you know I've suffered a lot um obviously I'm part of the relationship but I've felt there's been some really harsh behavior let's put it like that and the going back to what Nikki was saying about how she felt I felt like I just needed distance and it's somewhat hard because we're forced to see each other almost daily but I was there was less engagement from me and I felt that's helped the distance I've been trying as much as possible with the meta and more recently um especially since I did the the new year retreat sort of focusing um on the positives of of their character and trying to see that I can see they are suffering a lot uh, a lot and they don't realize and they're very lost um and it's, you know, that's, but at the same time, then it comes over to me and others maybe um, in a very aggressive, it can be quite, you know, putting me down can be, it makes you feel awful, really horrible. But that distance has helped me. And maybe a bit of distance will also help you reflect. I guess it's like when you meditate, it gives you that peace to then see what is right for you. And if you have a bit of distance, that answer will maybe will give itself, will allow you to see if you can give them more meta, if you feel comfortable around them, or it's just engaging less with them, but maybe sometimes, or it may be that that you move on. It's you've had the relationship that's worked between you and that it might not work. I don't know. Hopefully that's helpful. But I think thanks for sharing your uh situation, because I think it's good when you actually have these real life examples that are very close to your heart. It's a really good point that it's never that clear cut. It's messy. It's stick, you know, it's it's multifaceted and complex sometimes. Yeah. I also really appreciate both you and Bill, Sean and Bill saying that uh, you know, it's okay to have that distance because I think that's something I also have to like fully imbibe sometimes. 
you know, especially as a Buddhist nun who's supposed to be compassionate to everybody, right? You somehow have, sometimes have this idea that that should manifest a certain way, as in everyone can come to the Vihara, right? But then from time to time, there are people who behave in ways that are really quite harmful and, you know, make it very difficult for me to perform my role. And I actually have to say it's not going to be beneficial, you know, to have to have that especially when I'm alone. <laughs> so sometimes I find that really difficult. And I even spoke to my mom tonight. She said, why, why are you make such a big thing of it? You just say no. <laughs> but that's not how I've actually been brought up at all. <laughs> so I need to hear it, you know, again and again. I need to hear that. So I think it's really nice to, uh, to hear these perspectives. Thank you. I hope that also helps Nikki, because as I say, maybe not the that's maybe not the first thing that comes to my mind always, although I do think, you know, I know that the Buddha advises that as well. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else on this? We're actually 10 minutes from uh, from the end and there is another sutta, but I kind of feel like that might be a bit much for today. We'd probably just have to read through it and that would be the end of it. Uh I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do that if if people feel up for it, or we can see if there's anything else people want to share. I'll just read out Sean's comment because we didn't hear it from the box, but he says he's been doing the same as Olivia. That means the uh, focusing on the good in others uh, over the past week since the New Year retreat. Yay! <laughs> and have noticed a big difference. That's great. I get inspired to do that too. Yeah. Yeah, because the changes within, right, it's not really about trying to analyze the people kind of correctly, because <laughs> you can never know. Uh, you can never really get a measure of anyone, not even of yourself. But it's about that difference in oneself. Yeah, definitely. And sometimes that's not the best way of practice, because sometimes, you know, difficulties are there and we can if we do that practice too much we actually are in denial sometimes of of things that are actually too harmful to be around so so again you know we have to be very honest with ourselves and accept where we're at because we're not perfect human beings who can handle everything and I've noticed that some people seem to be able to but often it's because they've got huge support systems around them and a lot of uh, protection you know people aren't going to get that close it's very different when you're alone with people in your family or, you know, in a in a house or a living situation. It's uh, extremely different to being like in a huge protected space with, where you see people for five minutes and that's it. So, yeah. Okay. I don't know. I feel like it's a bit much to go through the next one. Any anyone would love to go through more? No. Okay, so I will just read out the comments. I've been doing the same since I returned from Oxford, and it's really helped. So that's someone else here who has uh, also been focusing on on the good in others, and uh, hopefully as well from time to time doing the opposite and just saying, okay, now it's enough. Not looking at the faults, but you know, now it's enough. Like now I'm not feeling so great. I need space because that's also giving yourself time. We can be come to other centric as well. Uh, we need to give ourselves, like I think Sean said, now the the space to keep the perspective, keep things in perspective, and uh, keep our minds balanced. I found that very helpful, you know, especially when I'm staying outside the monastery and I'm exposed to all kinds of things I wouldn't normally be, like just TV, right? Even just things like the amount of TV, even if I'm not sitting there, like the noise of it, the agitation of it, and and just taking myself off when I find I'm getting irritated or picking up some of that energy, just taking myself off and closing the door to meditate is uh, really, really key. Not leaving it too long <laughs> until I'm kind of... <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, very lovely. I think next week, uh, next week I'll be doing the Sutta class. I'm not sure it's actually online net, listed as a Sutta class next week. Is it on the website? Does anyone know? I might have to change it. It does say we're doing one, yeah? Good, good, good. So I don't have to change anything. So I am doing one, but it'll be from Cambridge. So you'll get yet another background design. Today we have um, the Buddha, a very small silver Buddha, and also Jeropin, my lovely bear. <laughs> um, okay, one more question. Keep coming in. They keep coming in. So 
<laughs> I don't know if it's really a question, but uh, a comment. It's important to also note your attachment to helping others and to step back. Yes, absolutely. Sometimes we become overly involved, right? We think we're helping, but we're just getting involved and interfering, actually. <laughs> we think we know best. We're maybe not listening to when they've had enough of us or to when, you know, we're just running on restlessness or interfering kind of mode. So definitely, yeah. <laughs> and to step back. Diana says, I hope when Piti Sukha is well. She is upstairs, actually. She lives, uh, she's been here for many, many months while I've been on retreat, but now I'm back at my parents' place. We have Venerable Piti Sukha, the teddy bear bikini, and uh, Britain's first. And <laughs> a jump bear, probably also Britain's first. And uh, Bamboozle, who's the gender non binary deer definitely Britain's first so they'll all come back with me to Oxford hopefully if I remember <laughs> no I think I'll bring them back <laughs> good so I think I shall hand over to someone Manori who's going to say a few words to end and then I will make sure we've covered all the upcoming retreats as well <laughs> yeah so Today's Sutta discussion is offered on a donation basis in the spirit of generosity. Any contribution you are able to make is very gratefully received and will help support Venerable Chanda's physical needs, the day-to-day -day running of our Nevihara in Oxford, and the development of England's first monastery where women can train towards the full bhikkhuni ordination. We have to keep it, keep reminding that. I've now adding the link for the donation and and also if you are capable you can provide a food dana to venerable by visiting the vihara or remote ordering buddha created the four fall sangha for us to live in a community and as a lay person it is our duty to look after the needs of the monastics so if you are keen to provide food please contact team at anukampaproject.org for more details. Also, you can offer a supermarket delivery as well. And for all those inquiries, please check with team at anukampaproject.org. And um, on the special events, uh, there is a one-day practice with Oxford Insight coming on the 28th of January. If you are keen, you can get registered. Uh, it, the details are in the website and in the last uh, newsletter as well. And uh, and also Ajahn Brahmali's eight-day residential retreat in May. I think it still has places available. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Beautifully said. And uh, yeah, the uh, retreat in Oxford is a day retreat with me on the soft mind, my, one of my favourite subjects. <laughs> uh, it actually is a, a real thing. Uh, in Pali, it means mudu, which means soft anyway. Uh, so that's a day retreat. And uh, yeah, there's definitely places on Ajahn Bramali's retreat. I actually went to visit the venue today for the second time. I mean, actually for many times because I've we've done a retreat there before, but it was really lovely going back. And uh, it's really in the middle of nowhere, but you can get there <laughs> from Sheffield or Manchester. But when you're there, it feels like, oh, you've just got countryside around you. It's in a small, cute village, but there's countryside everywhere. You can walk for hours. And um, and it was it brought back a lot of happy memories. So a few of you are registered, but not enough. So do come because that way Ajahn Pramali will keep coming to England. Otherwise, he might go to Poland. He is going to Poland afterwards. And I know there they've got huge amounts of people who are into him. So we have to keep him coming here. I think it's, well, I don't know if it's that much closer for most of you. But anyway, this way he can support the bikinis as well. So. I also just want to say hi to uh, Leonie, who's here. Hi, Leonie. <laughs> That's Naily's younger sister, but I need to wave to you because you're very important in this discussion. <laughs> Thank you for being there. <laughs> Lovely. Well, I've enjoyed it very much as well. So um, 
yeah I look forward to seeing people next week please take care of each other lovely to see Marion and Melanie together as well I think Marion your hair was shorter before maybe that's why first I thought you were crystal was it shorter before or maybe you tie it back I don't know yeah <laughs> so nice to see you both there together oh it's, isn't it one of your birthdays isn't that why yeah Marion or Melanie I need to unmute you <laughs> yeah it's my birthday tomorrow oh happy birthday for tomorrow Thank that's you. wonderful oh that's really great Thank you to everyone <laughs> Oh, I'm sure the whole group wants to wish you happy birthday and sending you lots of <laughs> That's great. I, I kind of wish that we had a meta meditation tomorrow, but I haven't put it on the website, so I guess it's a bit short notice. But I'm hoping not, mm, let me think. So not next Saturday, but the one after that, we'll do a meta meditation. So like Sunday, the, what would it be? Around about the 22nd, something like, Saturday, sorry, Saturday, the 21st, 22nd. Yeah, we'll do a meta meditation. I'll put it on the website. But anyway, I'm thinking of you, uh, Marion, with meta on your birthday. Okay. <laughs> all right. Shall we unmute you all and you can wave goodbye if you wish?